The Crisis is finally here. What is up, guys? Welcome to my review for Crisis on Infinite Earths Episode 1, or Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 1, which is Supergirl Season 5, Episode 9, which I think you could say without a shadow of a doubt, the best episode of Supergirl so far, by far, and I doubt there's ever going to be an episode going forward that will ever be as good as this one, as this episode is incredibly fun, the stakes are so high, there's obviously a lot of emotion to it, there are several DC universes they add, the Arrowverse here. There's so much going for this episode, and this is probably the best crossover episode we've ever gotten, but I pr it probably won't be the best for very long. So let's get right into the review, starting with the beginning, which is the Monitor's narration explaining the multiverse and the Age of Heroes. So this narration I thought was pretty awesome. The uh, accompanying visuals that we saw with like these couple different universes splitting apart, like it mainly focused on the sun, which is unusual. I definitely expected it to more focus on Earth, but it was still really cool seeing all these suns replicate, duplicate over and over again with the multiverse being recreated over and over again. And the explanation from the monitor that this all happened at the beginning of time where it started, where it was just one thing and then it, it, it kept on replicating and duplicating over and over again, that is very comic book accurate. In fact, this whole crossover is significantly more comic accurate, not the actual story and exactly beat for beat, but the, the concepts they use are a lot more accurate to the comic than I initially expected. Then the monitor also explains the upcoming crisis and the age of heroes, which was also really, really cool. I do think that they maybe could have used some better clips showing the age of heroes, like maybe some team up shots specifically from Invasion or Crisis on Earth X, or maybe some better shots from certain characters, but either way, it was definitely still a very cool narration overall and right after that we go straight into the destruction of several different universes and this montage was just so cool, so I'll go universe by universe here and uh, talk about what I thought about each one of them. So first of all, that there's Earth-89, the Batman and Batman Returns uh, universes, and it's definitely really cool that those movies are now a part of the Arrow vs. Multiverse, even though that universe was destroyed. But this part of the montage was especially cool because we heard the Danny Elfman uh, Batman score, which is a very, very iconic uh, theme for Batman. That was really cool. Then there's also Earth-9, which we saw Jason Todd aka Robin, as well as Hank Hall, aka Hawk, which it turns out that Pagey was right about the Titans appearing in the crossover, even though it's only Robin and Hawk, it's still really, really cool, especially since Robin, a, a character who's never appeared in the Arrowverse before, but also this version of Robin, I think that he's a great character, one of the best characters in Titans itself, but with Earth-9 being destroyed, uh, unless this is some alternate Titans universe where the characters are similar, but it's not the same exact universe, Titans is completely over, even though Earth, uh, even though Season 3 is confirmed, so I wonder where they're going uh, with that, but then there's also Earth X, that's completely destroyed, Earth 66, again, completely destroyed, this is the Adam West Batman universe, and we saw Dick Grayson from that universe, another character who's never appeared in the Arrowverse uh, before, this is really cool because the way he talks, obviously very similar to how he talked in Adam West, which is just a, a very iconic way uh, of talking, a very iconic rock. Uh, Robin speech from that universe, and that was like, like, holy jeepers, Batman, something like that, so this whole montage was amazing, and I absolutely loved it, and it obviously added a lot to the Arrowverse with the Batman universes, Earth 89 and 66, as well as the Titansverse, or at least some version of the Titansverse with at least Robin and Hawk. So after the antimatter wave comes for those four different universes, the next stop is Earth 38, and that's where the episode really begins. Supergirl fights this dragon spike from from the previous season. I think it was season four, honestly. I don't really remember at this point. However, I think this is maybe a little bit of a unnecessary budgetary restraint. I mean, they had this complete like like the CGI creature, this dragon CGI that maybe could have gone to other parts of this crossover. And I'm not gonna say this episode looks bad, and I'm not gonna say that the budget is low for this episode because it's it's pretty clear that. It it is not at all, but maybe this CGI creature, which was unnecessary, the CGI money could have gone to something else. Either way, though, definitely a pretty good way to start the episode, as right after the she fights the dragon, the antimatter wave is coming for Argo as well as Earth. 
So during this scene, while the Super Friends are talking about the wave of antimatter, and if you don't know, the Super Friends is the name of Team Supergirl as of season four. Anyway, they talk about the wave of antimatter, and this is where they learn about the crisis through John Jones, which is different from Arrow and the Flash because they knew about the crisis for a while now. They've known since the beginning of their seasons, and even a little bit before that for Oliver and uh, the ending of season seven. But Supergirl is different, and while I think it would have been better if they focused on the crisis this entire time, this is uh, even with. I mean, I mean, with this, it was a good time to for John to be the the explanation for all of this to for the super friends about the crisis. But then we go to Argo City, where we see Lois and Clark taking care of John Kent. With this being the debut of this character, which is really cool because he's definitely a great character in the comics, and I'm definitely really excited to see this version of Superboy on screen in the Superman in the Superman and Lois TV show. But I also think that the fact that Lois mentions Doomsday here is really cool. Doomsday's never been mentioned before. And this is good. This just confirms that he exists. And while it doesn't seem like the death of Superman story happened in this universe, it did definitely happen in a different universe, which we saw in the trailer. But that was Lex Luthor, not Doomsday. Regardless, this is I definitely think really cool because this confirms the existence of Doomsday and another Superman villain where Superman himself faced off against, which makes like four, which is General Zod, Lex Luthor, Doomsday, and uh, yeah, that's it. So three villains, whatever. It was a really cool scene, especially when right after that. That the wave of antimatter comes for Argo. This is, I think, where the episode starts getting really, really high in its stakes, and it doesn't stop being that for the rest of the episode, and even going to the next episode, which is maybe, like, the best thing about this crossover. Previous crossovers, the stakes have never been really that high, especially for uh, the first couple, but even for Crisis on Earth X, which a character died there, the stakes just didn't feel that high. For Elseworlds, the fact that there were less episodes, and it ended up being just a gateway to Crisis on Infinite Earths, the stakes were never that high for previous crossovers, but for this one, there's like, nothing is, nothing is barred off, any universe could be destroyed, I thought Earth-38 was safe, that is not true, I thought it was one of the main universes, it will be combined into Earth-1, but no, almost all of the people, or how, uh, at least over half of the people from Earth-38 were all destroyed and all died, so the stakes, especially starting here, where Argo is destroyed, it's a whole, a whole storyline that they had in Season 3 of Supergirl, a character, the mother of Clark, of, uh, Kara it all just happened so quickly and it really brings up the stakes of the crisis and I also really like the the part of the the episode the part of the scene where where Clark and Lois are are forced to send John away from the uh, the antimatter wave to earth in a pod he does end up uh, going to earth 16 through a wormhole or something but this obviously mirrors how Kal-El and also Kara Zor-El were also sent to earth in pods which I thought was a really awesome scene but then Argo is destroyed and right after that, we see Harbinger recruiting some heroes, which is also really cool. This is how the crisis started in the comics, with just Harbinger recruiting several heroes. Here, she recruits different characters, different heroes than what she recruited in the original comic, but these characters are mo more Arrowverse focused. Green Arrow and Mia Smoke, where you see the same scene you saw in the last episode. One part of it is a little bit different, where Harbinger doesn't say, I'm not Lila Michaels anymore. Everything else, however, is the exact same scene. Then Harbinger recruits the Flash, this time around, unlike Green Arrow getting a completely new scene where he's running around trying to investigate what's happening with the Red Skies, and he obviously knows about the crisis, but still, this is definitely a really cool part of the episode. Then Harbinger recruits Batwoman, pretty cool scene, recruits White Canary and the Atom, which is a more, a more comedic take on Harbinger recruiting a hero, which is what the Legends has been all about, maybe to uh, too much of an extent in Season 4. Regardless, though, definitely another great scene, and while we don't see it, Harbinger also also recruits Superman and the Lois and saves them from Argo. So then Harbinger brings the heroes to the D.E.O. All of the heroes she recruited, except for the Flash, the Atom, and White Canary, who are doing a reconnaissance, but this is the reunion between Kara and Clark and Lois, after she thinks that they died, and this is where she also learns that her mother died. For the most part, I do think that, considering this episode is mostly focusing on her 38, and the fact that Kara, more than anybody, until the end, however, or at least, is the most affected, I think they did a pretty good job at focusing on her reaction, even though maybe they, they could have showed it 
it a little bit more. Who knows, maybe in the next episode they'll show her reaction to all of this. Also, uh, all, the re all the reactions to Oliver's death, which I will get to at the end of this review. But overall, this is also a pretty good scene. Right after that, we see Harbinger explaining to the heroes about the crisis, which is pretty clear that Oliver knows all about because he saw Earth 2 being destroyed by a wave of antimatter way before the crisis even began, which I hope that that is explained because it didn't seem like the crisis began until Nash freed the anti-monitor and yet Earth 2 was destroyed by a wave of antimatter. Regardless though, again, this, this whole thing is just really cool to build up towards all the heroes going up against the shadow demons later in the episode. The stakes are really high, it's just, it's really, really epic. Then we see the Quantum Tower, which we were seeing, we, we saw that in a sneak peek, but regardless of that, it's really, it's really surprising, honestly, that they're incorporating this, because the Quantum Towers were very integral to the Monitor's plan, and the Crisis as a whole in the original Crisis, where the towers obviously protected the universes from being destroyed, but also they were used to combine five of the remaining universes in the end, and while it does not seem like this Crisis will combine any universes, it will only save one, and that's Earth-1, and maybe a couple others, like the Smallville universe, and maybe others, but I just the fact that these quantum towers were integrated was really cool, and the whole concept of the quantum towers just saving the universe from the antimatter wave, while heroes have to fend off against the shadow demons, that's exactly what happened at the beginning of the crisis, and that is just, it's like I said earlier, more comic accurate than I initially expected. Right after that, we learn that John, the John Kent, that is, was sucked into a wormhole on his way to Earth and was sent to Earth-16. I guess or I guess now, all of a sudden, wormholes can go from universe to universe, which honestly, I mean, that, that, that isn't out of the realm of possibility, but then we also learn that that's where Star City 2486 is, which I think is a very good retcon. The fact that the Legends didn't actually go to only the future, they also went to an alternate universe, because that future, Star City 2046, just doesn't make any sense sense, with Grant Wilson especially, and Connor Hawk, where in that universe John Diggle Jr. looks exactly like Connor Hawk does on this universe, so that future, that timeline, didn't really make any sense for Earth-1, so I'm glad it's an alternate universe. However, when we see this universe, there are other complications that do arise that don't really make sense for what we've learned uh, previously with Star City 2046. But Lois, Brainy, and Sarah all go to Earth-16 on a mission to find John Kent. And like I said, that's also where Star City 246 is, which I'll get back to once we get back to that in the episode, as I am basically going scene uh, by scene. Then we learn that what John's role in this episode will be. He sets out to help evacuate the Earth, also telling Alex to get Lena's help to open a portal to Earth-1, which again, I guess now Lena has the capabilities of multiversal travel. Regardless though, I mean, definitely, she's definitely smart smart enough to do something like that, but I, I don't know, they just never explained how she's able to, uh, to open a portal, other than she's really smart. Regardless, though, it doesn't really bother me that much from this episode, as right after that, we also get a talk between Clark and Kara, where Clark is definitely a little bit less hopeful than Kara, which is definitely a little bit annoying, because Superman should be the most hopeful person in the entire universe, while it seems like they're giving all that more to Supergirl, but I guess it might be just something that she, he's worried about his son, which definitely makes a lot of uh, sense, and while this scene I think is a little bit too long, it is definitely a pretty good one. Right after that, there's a scene of Oliver giving Mia her suit, the Green Arrow suit, as well as the Green Arrow identity, which I think I'm much more accepting of than I ever would have expected before going into this season. In season 7, in the flash forwards, I absolutely hated Mia. She was so annoying. The actress, I don't think, was very good. Her storyline was bad, and the fact that she lived in this uh, boring future was definitely, it didn't help either. But then in season 8, while she did have a couple annoying scenes where she was angry at Oliver, that didn't, that, that, that all went away at the end of the last episode, and I think think because of that, I'm a lot more, I'm, I like me a lot more, I'm a lot more accepting of her uh, taking up the mantle of the Green Arrow, which is why this is a legitimately pretty good scene. And then we get a scene between Barry and Oliver, really the only scene in the entire episode where Barry and Oliver talk, and considering I, I, either Oliver dies in the episode, but I mean, I'll get back to that later, he's not dead, or at least he's not going to be dead for long at this point, even still, he will have his own storyline separate from The Flash, so I definitely wanted to see some more scenes between Oliver and Barry in this first episode, especially since, uh, since they both think they are going to die, and they definitely have something to talk about there, even with Oliver telling Barry that Earth 2 
was destroyed, which at this point, he just, he doesn't know about yet. However, still, for the small amount of time we get between them, it's definitely really cool. And right after that, Oliver just summons the monitor, which is really badass. The fact that he, he could just summon a god uh, whenever he wants, like we see here, it's really, uh, really cool. It's definitely not the most badass or most heroic we see Oliver in this episode, but regardless, it's definitely really cool to see. And Oliver asks the monitor how Barry can die when the monitor said that Oliver will die in exchange for Kara and Barry surviving. However, the monitor says that that was Elseworlds and the crisis is different, and that's true because Elseworlds is all about the monitor, and that was in his control, while the crisis is not. The crisis is the anti-monitor and the wave of the of the anti the antimatter wave, and the monitor has no control over whether or not these people and these heroes uh, will die, so that was definitely also a really good scene. So Alex then recruits Lena, who her storyline this season in Supergirl has not been well handled, I don't think, and her hatred for Alex and Supergirl and the Super Friends is not exactly founded, but even still, she obviously helps because she does not want the world to be destroyed. Regardless, though, we then cut to Sarah, Brainy, and Lois finding John in the bunker way quicker than I expected, but they all also run into the future Oliver, who is not only way younger looking than we previously saw in Earth. 16 when the legends went there in uh, the beginning of season one and I know some people in the comments will say it's a different universe that was the actual future but that's not what they said the legends said or a, a Ray said that it, it turns out that they actually went to a different universe not just the future and this is the same thing but we see Oliver he's way younger than we pre previously seen him but not only that he thinks that Sarah died in the gambit which creates a whole nother continuity error as in Star City 2046 the whole thing was that the the Star City fell apart after the legends left and never returned, which means that not only did Sarah survive the Gambit and Oliver knew this, she also became the Canary and became the White Canary and helped form the legends, or at least join the legends, so this is very different from what we saw previously, maybe a flashpoint happened in this universe as well, we don't know, but this is definitely a continuity error that I hope they fix in the future. But I just think it's a little weird how they tried to fix this continuity error with uh, Star City 2046 not making any sense as the future for any Earth 1, but then uh, created a whole new one where this universe is completely different from when we previously saw it. They could just say that, that there was a flashpoint in this universe. I think that that's the easiest explanation. While those characters are on Earth-16, the Justice League, which is what I'm calling them from now on, are trying to protect the Quantum Tower, the Green Arrows, Batwoman, and the Atom, which is the powerless members of the Justice League, are all trying to fend off the Shadow Demons, while the Superman and Supergirl and the Flash, I, I think it was like uh, they were trying to calm down some earthquakes or something like that. The reason they did this is so that the powerless heroes, Green Arrow, Green Arrow, Batwoman, and the Atom, could all have their own sh time to shine without the other powerful heroes overpowering them, because right later right after that we see the flash come in he takes out several shadow demons all on his own very quickly and even supergirl is impressed by this which i think shows that the flash is more powerful than any other member of the justice league which is comic book accurate that definitely is how it should be so i'm glad that they with flash and the two and the two kryptonians are not really there at this point they gave the green arrows batwoman and the atom a time to shine against the shadow demons and the atom also gave batwoman some sort of boost as her battery are now able to kill shadow demons pretty easily. But anyway, there's a couple minutes of the Justice League fighting the Shadow Demons, the Earth-38 heroes, including Martian Manhunter and Dreamer, along with, I guess, Guardian now, or Kelly Olsen, helping evacuate the Earth. It is more focused on National City than anything, but I guess it turns out that they saved billions of uh, people all across the whole world. Regardless, though, this whole sequence of events was really cool, and it felt very epic. The stakes were very high. I mean, you got the Justice League fighting some Shadow Demons and the whole world being evacuated. It was, it was just, it was really awesome. Right after that, we cut back to Earth-16, where Sarah talks to the future Oliver and talks about how everything that happened between them in the past was all for the best on Earth-1, which again, all of this is a bit of a continuity error on Earth-16, but regardless, this is definitely a pretty good scene. And while Sarah and Oliver didn't really get a goodbye scene in this episode, other than that time where Sarah, early in the episode, which I didn't even mention yet, that was also a good part of the episode where Sarah and Oliver are talking, Sarah's talking to Oliver about how he is now a father and how it very much 
much suits him. But beyond that, this is basically the goodbye scene between Sarah and Oliver as Oliver does die at the end of this episode, or at least either seemingly does or does die, but he will come back, which again, I will talk about at the end of this review. But yes, definitely, definitely a very good scene. So Superman and Supergirl fly up the power of the Quantum Tower with their heat vision. Of course, just like we saw earlier with Superman not being as hopeful as Supergirl, Superman also sizzles out a little bit before Supergirl. It's like five seconds before, but still, why, why, like, why is that? Why is that really necessary for Superman to always be constantly undermined by Supergirl and for Supergirl to constantly one-up him? However, at least this time around, they mention it. They actually, Clark actually mentions that Kara always has to one-up him, so at least that shows some kind of thing where earlier it was just Clark was like, yeah, you have a one-up and you're more powerful than me, that's good. At least now he's a little bit frustrated by that, which is, I think, a little bit more human and a little bit more three-dimensional for the character, which is why I don't mind it as much as I typically would. But anyway, the Justice League is fending off the Shadow Demons, the uh, the entire Earth, Earth-38, is being evacuated, but the Monitor shows up saying the battle is lost, as the heroes are being overwhelmed, uh, overwhelmed by the sheer number of Shadow Demons that are present, which, again, like I said in a previous trailer breakdown, I'm glad how this all's uh, shaked out. The Shadow Demons are not just cannon fodder for the Justice League to tear through, like the previous crossovers with, uh, with, the, with the Nazis and Earth-X, even the Dominators before that, and while there weren't any cannon fodder in Elseworlds, there, the cannon fodder is definitely something that they maybe could do a little better. I'm glad the Shadow Demons are legitimate threats, and they even not only look cool, but they are very much threatening, and they even managed to kill a character, which, yes, the, the cannon fodder Nazis did in Earth-X, but this one, it's first, it's, it's in the, the first part, and it really feels like they could do a lot more. Regardless, though, the Monitor transports all these heroes out of Earth-38 as Earth-38 is being evacuated, but Oliver refuses to leave. Eve, he shoots the monitor with some sort of shadow demon powered arrow which actually stops him and Oliver just stays there he runs out of arrows and he charges at the shadow demons in one of the most heroic moments in the entirety of the Arrowverse which is then even made more so heroic when he learned what this had what, what this effect was on the people of earth 38 regardless though this was an epic moment Oliver Oliver was amazing and I was in complete shock when the when what happened the aftermath of this was revealed. So Oliver lays there. I, I I didn't. I was not like accepting what was going on, and I kind of still don't because this is the first part, and there are four more parts where this crossover uh, mainly focuses on Oliver Queen. This whole setup for the crisis was all about Oliver, also Barry, but it was mostly focusing on Oliver, or at least he had the biggest role in the pre-crisis setup, and then he's killed off in the first part, which was definitely it. Definitely accomplished the shock value value they were maybe going for, and this scene was certainly emotional, and also, like I said, the heroic part of Oliver charging at the Shadow Demons and staying while the Monitor doesn't want him to and wants to get him out of there is enhanced by the fact that the Monitor says that Oliver saved around a billion people, while the, the time where Oliver was fending off the Shadow Demons before the Shadow Demons actually got to the Quantum Tower, during that time, there were a billion people that managed to get off of Earth-38, showing that Oliver saved a billion people, and while it wasn't on his universe, and while he died a lot earlier than I expected, that was the emotional or the heroic death that we probably all of ex all, all expected from Oliver, but even with that death, it's not gonna end here, as this death, while shocking and a little bit emotional, was not nearly as emotional as I expected, because it was less about how emotional and sad it was, and more about how shocking it was, and how unbelievable it actually was. Just the shock of it all, of Oliver dying in the first part of the crossover, it was legitimately overwhelming. Now, I don't think Oliver is truly, he's dead, but I don't think he's completely gone. Not only is there a theory going around that Oliver will become the Spectre taking over from Jim Corrigan, which would be pretty cool, but also just look at this photo. John Constantine, who's appearing in the next episode with Mia, Oliver, and Diggle. My theory is that Constantine will take Diggle and Mia to Oliver, who's going to be in purgatory, 
and Purgatory is going to be modeled after Lian Yu, and they're going to try to help get him back, and maybe during this, Oliver will become the Spectre. The, the, I think the evidence of that is in this photo, but also the fact that Jim Corrigan, the current Spectre, or the Spectre in the comics, is seen in this photo right here in the exact same, like, terrain as Oliver, and Oliver being in Purgatory is too, too, I don't know, it's too fitting to have, to actually not happen, as maybe in real, in, in this universe, in this multiverse, Purgatory looks like Lee and Yu, or maybe Purgatory looks like whatever you want it to look like, but be, I think it would be really cool if Purgatory looks like Lee and Yu for literally everybody, and that's why Lee and Yu is, is called Lee and Yu, but regardless, there's no way that this is the end of Oliver's story. However, this is probably his final death scene, unless he does come back from the dead and as the Spectre or as Oliver dies yet again, and I honestly hope that does happen because this death scene was not as emotional as it should have been because it was less about the death and more about the shock and how unbelievable it truly was. And while that does sound like denial, just look at the photos of the fact that Oliver was killed off in the first episode. There's absolutely no way that this is the end of Oliver Queen, and I would be surprised if it is, and honestly, very disappointed. However, uh, if there are people who maybe, like, will give this episode a low score because they expected Oliver to survive longer, I don't think you should, or at least wait until the next episodes of The Crisis come out, because there's there's no way this is the true end of Oliver Queen. Look at the photos, look at the evidence, there's absolutely no way. But after Oliver's death, we see Nash return, which from now on I'm going to call him Pariah because that is what he is, which uh, this confirms that Nash is indeed Pariah, and that's what happened in the last scene we saw him in, he became Pariah, which is, again, more accurate to the comics than I initially expected, as Nash Wells, while he doesn't exist in the comics, and his name is Kelmosa, not Nash Wells, the fact that Pariah seemingly created or started the crisis and freed the Anti-Monitor, or at least thinks he does, does is exactly what happened in the comics, and now he's sent from universe to universe, seeing what he did and seeing the effects of him releasing the Anti Monitor. And it may be released; it may be uh, confirmed later that he wasn't responsible for the start of the crisis, like in the comics. But for now, that part of it is a lot more comic accurate than I initially expected, and also Pariah's costume is certainly pretty awesome. In conclusion, this episode does have a pretty big continuity error with a Star City 2046. There are certain Lena scenes I don't like, and also there's the fact that they make, again, Kara look better than Ka than Clark is not necessary. I honestly think that all, the, all those things are nitpicky, and there's no reason that would bring down this episode at all. Like I said, just the beginning with the montage and all those universes being brought into the Arrowverse, and that's awesome. The stakes of this episode are awesome. The epicness are all just handled so well. It's emotional. It's epic. It's awesome, and this is the best crossover episode we've gotten so far. However, I'm hoping and I'm expecting for the next four episodes to either be as good, or maybe some of them will be better. Regardless, though,